My name is Matthew Baum. I'm the Marvin Kalb Professor of Global Communication at the Kennedy School here at Harvard. Um, I'm going to just take a moment to introduce the panelists, and then uh, we'll go ahead and turn the floor over to them, because uh, we're here to hear them, them speak and not me. Uh, first, uh, Hasid Shah is a Neiman Berkman Fellow this year uh, in Journalism and Innovation at Harvard. Uh, he's researching digital news services during his um, fellowship. Uh, for people connecting to the internship for the first time uh, using smartphones. Uh, in his day job, when he's not here, he's a senior producer at the BBC News in London. He's worked there also as a news editor, a digital media strategist, and a foreign affairs producer specializing in South Asia. Uh, he's covered major breaking stories and events around the world, including the Mumbai attacks, riots in France, violence in Indian-administered Kashmir, the London bombings, elections in the UK, France, and India, regime change in Egypt and the earthquake in Japan. To his right is Ravi Nesman. He is also currently a Neiman Fellow at Harvard. He spent the past 13 years as a foreign correspondent for the AP. Um, from 2009 to 2013, he was AP's South Asia, she South Asia she chief, excuse me, uh, chief of bureau based in Delhi. Before that, he was based in Sri Lanka from 2007 to 2009, where he covered the bloody end of that country's civil war. Uh, before he was uh, apparently invited to leave by the, by the government there. Exactly. <laughs> uh, among other stories he covered in South Asia, uh, the siege in Mumbai, the assassinations of Benazir Bhutto, and the Bangladesh uh, garment factory collapse. He's also worked as a foreign correspondent in the Middle East and Africa. And finally, closest to me is Jonathan Scheinan. He's news editor at The New Yorker, where he works on U.S. and world news for the publication's website. From 2010 to 2013, he was senior editor of The Caravan, a monthly magazine in Delhi, uh, which was widely credited with bringing long-form narrative journalism to India. And before that, he was editor of The Review, a weekly supplement to the national newspaper in Abu Dhabi. And with that, I believe uh, uh, each of the panelists is going to make some comments, five to ten minutes, and then uh, we'll turn to some questions. Uh, to try and frame the discussion and open it up to the audience. Uh, and we'll begin with Robbie. Okay, so I want to start with a story of one man. Um, as so many stories in India begin, I think, with one man or with one woman. And his name is Anil Gupta, and he is a professor of business administration in Ahmedabad in Gujarat. And Anil Gupta, twice a year, sets off on a journey. He walks through rural India for 10 days. In the summers, he goes through uh, central or southern India. In the winters, he goes through the mountains in the northeast or the north. And I asked him why, this is ridiculous, why would you not flip that, right? Why would you not go into the mountains in beautiful summer and into st steamy hot central and southern India in the winter when it's bearable? And he said, well, that defeats the purpose. We're supposed to suffer, just like the people who live there suffer. And he doesn't drive around in an SUV, he walks 15, 20 kilometers a day from rural village to rural village. And as he gets into each village, he says, bring out your inventions. Has anyone here created anything? And some villages, people come out with shocking, amazing creations. Um, one man you know, made a cotton gin that costs you know, a few dollars out of wood Whereas in the market, that would cost, you know, 50 times as much. Um, other villages, they bring out local herbs that they use yeah, in healing. And he brings with him, often, his students, other people, young people around India, who live in the cities. And for them, this is kind of being a foreign correspondent. They go from village to village. They eat the watery dal and lentils that the local women bring them for breakfast and lunch and dinner. They sleep in schoolyards in, 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 in the summer when I went with him in the open air because it's too hot to actually go into the, into the school and sleep. And this is a different life for them because India is not one country. India is many countries. And they're visiting a different part of India, a part of India that they've never seen before. And many of them kind of thought they understood their country, but as I was watching them over the many days that we were with Professor Gupta, we watched as they 
recognize that they didn't know anything about their country. These people lived a life that was so different from the life that they lived. Many of them at the beginning would pretend to know and give us advice. I spend a lot of time in rural India. They would say things to me like, you know, don't drink the water, which I, I kind of knew. But I knew that and I brought chlorine pills and they did not and many of them ended up on the back of motorcycles at the end of the night being driven to the train station to go home because they were so ill, because they were so ill prepared for what they were going to find in their own country. Um, and I think what's more interesting to me were the people who, many of them dropped out because this was not what they were expecting. They didn't quite know what to expect. But many of them I spoke to were coming back year after year to visit this other part of India in their own country and try to see you know, where the real problems were and try to relate to these people. This is 70% of the country. So much of what we cover is foreign correspondence. What, what the world sees has been India shining, people moving to the cities and buying expensive cars or corruption or whatever. I mean, these are issues, definitely. But 70% of the country live in rural areas and they live in a manner that even many Indians don't know how they live. What was also interesting to me about the about this story is that it is a story of one man. He felt that the problems of India were going to be solved by technology, but not necessarily by transistors and, and smartphones. They were going to be solved in part by the technology that already existed within India, the local knowledge that people had that they needed to disseminate among themselves. He was there to empower people and to show them that they could solve their own problems. And uh, for me, why the story of one man is the most important story in India is because when you look at India, it's overwhelming. It's 1.2 billion people. More than 600 million people don't have toilets, right? So one man created an NGO called Sulab. He built a million toilets. Or he says he built a million toilets. Let's take him at his word. But that's a million toilets. There's still 600 million people. It's mind-boggling to think about it. And the stories for me that were most fascinating were always that one person who thought they were going to make change and in some small corner did make change. And I view it almost as this tidal wave of a problem coming and this one person standing there putting their hand up to try to block the water. And no, they're not going to stop this. You can't. There's 600 million people without toilets. But you can stop a little bit of it. And if enough people do that, there can be a little movement, a little bit of change. The other thing that uh, this story makes me think about is when I came back and after I wrote the story. I checked him out. This man got many awards. He's been doing this for decades. I was speaking to one of my, the father of one of my daughter's friends who is Indian. He's a businessman. And I mentioned Anil Gupta. And he said, oh, that man, he's out for himself. He's just corrupt. He's stealing these people's inventions and making money off of it. And I said, well, actually, as far as I can tell, that's not true. I spoke to people who were the most successful ones who, one man who created a refrigerator out of clay that runs on evaporating water that's become somewhat successful. And he, they say he's taken none of their money. This is a man who's walking 15 kilometers in 120 degree heat from village to village. If he wanted to just steal inventions, why was he not in an SUV, in an air-conditioned car driving from village to village? But for a lot of people, they feel that they're, it's, it's almost inconceivable that there can be people just of goodwill trying to help their country. But there are people out there, and there are a lot of people, and when you can kind of crack below the surface and find these people, they have quite amazing stories to tell. And that, I think, was, for me, that was... Um, one of the great challenges of being a foreign correspondent there was trying to find these people who were working so hard to change the enormity of this country. So. Um, well, my story is also about one man, um, me. I, <laughs> I, I, I was born and brought up in London. Um, obviously, I'm of Indian, not obviously, but I'm, I'm of Indian origin. Um, my grandparents left India in the 1920s. My parents grew up in East Africa, in Kenya, and I was born and raised in London. I didn't even go to India till I was about 22 years old. Um, when I became a journalist at the BBC, I, the only place really I wanted to work was India. Um, you know, it's a place that I had 
kind of grown up with in the sense that I spoke, I still speak Gujarati, I eat, you know, Indian food. The, 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 the culture of the country was part of my, my upbringing in, in, in London. And I wanted to see it for myself. I wanted to work as a journalist in, in, in what I knew was a challenging environment. Um, I eventually got posted to Delhi in 2008 um, to, to cover the, not just India, but the entire region of South Asia. And, you know, at first I was like super confident. I thought, you know what, I, you know, it's fine. I'm, I'm Indian. It's, it, life will be relatively easy for me. I'll be able to have access to things and I speak, you know, Gujarati well, my Hindi is okay. I can sort of get by and I can, I can operate much more freely than perhaps white colleagues can. And partly that's true, um, but one incident really stands out which made me realize that I'm actually foreign and I'm actually considered pretty foreign in India. I was um, on the reporting, or preparing for a reporting assignment to Kashmir, Indian Kashmir. And, you know, at the time, and this happens every so often for you know, those who know the, the, the region, at the time there were pretty vicious riots happening, you know, the usual thing, gangs of youths, the police hitting back, uh, the security services hitting back far too hard, all that sort of stuff. So we were there to cover these riots and just to see what was going on. We knew we were going there for a few days because back then uh, there weren't daily flights from Delhi to Srinagar. So you had a few days to plan and getting permits to go as well. As a foreign journalist on a, on a journalist visa, you had to kind of get the appropriate permission back then to go. So in the meantime, we had five days kicking our heels in Delhi. So me and my colleague, who is also a British guy of Indian origin, um, we thought, OK, look, we've got to kind of prepare properly. We should, you know, safety is really important and, you know, we, we've got to blend in. So we thought, OK, let's um, get some Kashmiri Solwar kameez. We'll buy those so we've got the right clothes. Um, let's, 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 let's not shave for a few days. Let's have beards because these, all these guys out there have got beards. So, and we, we thought we were really smart. Um, we get there, and what I'd kind of forgotten was that um, India is a country of many different races, and Kashmiri men are generally tall and fair skinned and handsome. And these two little Gujarati fellows with beards turn up um, and didn't blend in at all. That, that, that tactic was, just did not work. And I think that was the first time when I realized that. Um, I'm a foreign correspondent in India. My story, like Hasid's, is also about me. Um, <laughs> well, I, so I, um, I come at this, I think, from a slightly different angle because I was uh, a foreign editor in India, um, but I was working at the caravan at an Indian publication. Um, a joke that I've told a hundred times and will never tire of telling is that I used to say that I was not an Indian, but I had become an Indian journalist. Um, because you know, I had come into India in 2010. I had been in the Middle East. Um, I had done a fair bit of work on with reporters who were writing. I was working for a newspaper in the Gulf, um, and I had worked with a lot of Indian writers who were covering Indian politics, who were writing about Indian culture. Um, but I came in um, to Caravan, which at the time was about nine months old, and had been started with sort of a very upfront declaration that, you know, we want to bring something like the New Yorker or the Atlantic Monthly to India. Um, and I think my experience um, was both of being a foreigner, but also of trying to negotiate, uh, in some ways, how to produce a foreign form of journalism um, that would be by Indians and, you know, produced by Indians and read by Indians, although, of course, you know, a narrow upper crust of Anglophone readers. Um, so I think my story is of someone who came in and, and almost took as a subject the Indian media, and I know this is, you know, not exactly what we're talking about, but I think we'll, this must be part of, you know, how the foreign media and the local media interact, was trying to understand how the Indian media functions, which, of course, had a very practical pay off as a magazine editor because you're trying to figure out how to do something that's different and separate and, you know, uh, doesn't compete with the Indian media where they're going to be stronger than you are, but, you know, is able to sort of exceed what they can do in certain areas. Um, and I think um, something, you know, I don't know how much more we'll get to talk about it today, but what I became very interested in was the way in which um, 
coming from the West, um, and I think this is probably true of both the US and the UK, uh, there's a certain sort of set of relationships between institutions, one of which is the media. So when we think about how the media interacts with the public, when we think about how the media interacts with a democratic system, when we think about how the media interacts with a government or with state security services or any number of other institutions, um, a lot of how we think about what it means to be a journalist and what a journalist does and the impact that journalism can have uh, is contingent on these relations as we understand them in the West. And I think something that um, is not unique to India, but India, because it's a democracy, because you know, in many other formal ways, um, it, it resembles you know, some of the openness, the freedom of expression that we take for granted in the West, that uh, it's a it, very interesting place to see how different forms of contemporary media function very differently. So the Indian media, I think, um, is much more, I would say, vitiated by politics than is the case in either the US or the UK, not because the publications are more avowedly political, but because readers, and I think if we talk about the election at all, we'll see quite a lot of this, because the readers are conditioned not to believe that anything that's in the media is independent or verifiable. Um, and so you have a situation where um, what we see as kind of what objectivity in media looks like and what independence in journalism looks like uh, depends a great deal on the trust of the reader. Uh, and so you can assume in a Western context that you know, if you have an anonymous source telling you something and you print it in your newspaper or you print it in the AP or you report it on the BBC, that you know, the reader is going to come at this and say, okay, we, we understand that you know, you're professional journalists here and when you say that such and such person is a senior Obama administration official, we believe that. Um, you will find in India, my magazine Caravan, after I left, uh, a story I had, I had commissioned when I was still there, published a rather explosive piece which uh, consisted of an interview with a jailed kind of Hindu nationalist leader um, who was accused of plotting to blow up a train. And the public response was that the entire interview had been fabricated. Um, and the BJP, the opposition political party, came out and said, this is all a lie. None of this is true. And then they released the audio tapes. And the response was, well, you fabricated these audio tapes. Uh, so I think my interest, and, and I think we see at this interaction where foreign correspondents come in, last week The Economist, as anyone who's paying close attention to the Indian election has seen, wrote a rather stern editorial urging Indians not to vote for Narendra Modi, uh, in which they basically said, look, we'd really like to like this guy, but, but he's, you know, he's not doing what we'd like him to do. Um, and there was, on social media at least, and even in the Indian media, uh, this huge upsurge of, you know, go to hell, Britishers. Uh, we don't, you know, what business do you have telling? Who paid you, you know, to, I mean, uh, uh, one major opposition leader said, you know, we think that there's an Italian family connected to the Congress party, which may have an ownership of the economist, and that explains things. So anyway, my story then, you know, is, is a bit less focused on the villages uh, and more focused on the question of, um, how do the existing media practices in India affect a practitioner either, you know, who is coming in from the outside and, and you know, trying to do work there? Thank you all very much. Um, I'd like to uh, exert the moderator's prerogative for, with the first question and then we'll uh, open it up to the floor. Uh, the election just came up and I, I thought I could use that maybe as just a frame for a, a, a bigger picture question about uh, the challenges you face uh, covering South Asia. So in, in the context of covering uh, a major election uh, such as um, is going on in India, um, very recently in Afghanistan as well, what is it that makes a story newsworthy? Um, what does the audience, the foreign audience, your audience outside of the country, in your estimation, what do they need to know about this? Uh, and is that different than what they want to know? And if so, why? And lastly, are the answers to these questions very different when you're thinking about a relatively mature, institutionalized democracy like India compared to a case like Afghanistan where you're talking about really the first attempt at a peaceful transition of power? Um, I'd like that was to six questions, I realize. <laughs> I'd like to say that we treat an election just like any other news story. You report what's newsworthy and you ignore what isn't. But elections are funny things, especially in Indian one where it lasts about four years. Um, they, they kind of demand, 
you've got entire bureaus of whether it's the BBC or the AP who are kind of expected to do a bit more than they would and, and only because the rest of the country, the rest of the media core, the local media are doing nothing else. Um, so you're, you're wondering, look, can I really publish a story about cricket or whatever it might be? Is, it, is this the time to even bother chasing that story? Or do I need to be on that election trail? And then you have to think about whether that's appropriate for your audience. And mostly it isn't. I mean, in India, the Indian election isn't that interesting to international audiences with the best will in the world. You know, there's a result which will have an, imp have, which will have an impact, obviously, on India and some impact on how the world views India. But the minutiae of the election isn't that exciting at all. It's really long as well. So there's a long time to be spending covering something that your audience doesn't care about. So it's, it is different to Afghanistan because it's the nature of the story is different. Completely different. I mean, Afghanistan is a country where um, British and American audiences, certainly, and others as well, have a vested interest because, you know, there has been a uh, war fought on that soil involving, you know, our troops. So there are entrenched political interests and intent, entrenched reasons why it's, a, it's, it's, it's more newsworthy for us. And the other basic fact that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, all kinds of things can happen during an Afghan election, um, which makes it just more interesting. So, yes, you cover these things as a basic news story using your basic news judgment, but B, you do get sucked into um, doing features and producing content that you might not otherwise just because it's happening. I, I would say that first off I've had the great pleasure of never having to cover an Indian election because I came in right after the last one I left thankfully right before this one and it, uh, it seems to me a, a thankless and Herculean task it goes on for as you said for seven weeks and what I think people don't really understand about India is that we have actually no idea what's going to happen in this election. Like, we know that in some places, and you've received, like you were saying, like reflected in the media, you don't trust what's in the local media. If, if we knew generally before the election in 2012 in the United States that it looked pretty likely Obama was going to win because there are polling and you can go out and it's a country of, it's a vast country, but of a certain size. When you get to India, like, how, where, where am I going to go that's going to show that to me? What poll am I going to trust of a, in a country of 1.2 billion people with horrendous polling that in, also in the last election showed the BJP was going to win and was wrong? And everybody knew the BJP was going to win, and they were all incredibly wrong in the last election. So how do we know exactly what's going to happen in this election? We don't know. You know, the the scuttlebutt, the media narrative uh, of the past six months, a year, is that you know Congress is, is corrupt and has presided over this very corrupt government and that Narendra Modi is riding this anti-corruption wave that is going to sweep away the detritus of Congress or maybe Arvind Kejriwal from the Ahmad Me party is going to somehow have some influence or maybe something else we don't even know. but. How, where is that narrative coming from? And I, I question the basis of that. That might be true. And we might see at the end of this election that that's exactly what happened. But I would say that I wouldn't be surprised if many other options potentially happened. If there's a stalemate and Congress and BJP end up with roughly similar numbers and someone else comes in as a kingmaker from outside of their coalitions, I wouldn't be totally surprised if there's... A lot of regional parties end up getting, you know, huge numbers of votes and that there's some stalemate where maybe they have to form a coalition or, you know, BJP sits as it could go absolutely anywhere. So now you're sitting here as a foreign correspondent with no direction at all, which is very rare in, in all the places that I've ever covered, that you can't look to the local media, you can't look to local polling. There's no guidepost. So now I can go, I can go to Uttar Pradesh and talk to people on the ground. I can go to five rallies, I can go to 10 rallies. But what does that mean? I mean, what, is ten, what do 10 rallies show me? I still have no empirical data to kind of frame this. I can say there has been a lot of corruption. I can go to a Modi rally and say, you know, there's uh, 50,000 people at this rally. But I don't, I don't, I still don't completely know what that tells me. Even if, even if you knew, 
even if you knew, even if you had. Well, I wouldn't write seven weeks of stories. No, exactly. even, even, if, even if you had like a really good track on what's going on. Yeah. How interesting is that to your audience, to the global I, audience? I would know? say that that I would give a little more credit for the importance of India, the Indian election, maybe than you did. I wouldn't. I still wouldn't give it no, as I, much I think, importance. I think as it's important, but some, I don't think it's particularly think. interesting other than the outcome. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think. I, think yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I sort of would pick up on what both of you guys have said. I mean, I think. Um, a friend of mine who's a reporter who covers politics and media for the Hindustan Times called me up and said, you know, I'm doing a piece on what the rest of the world thinks of the Indian election. Uh, it's a and I short said, piece. Okay, I can, you know, I said, please don't quote me because I'll get in trouble. Um, but, you know, nobody here cares. Um, no, I'm not supposed to say that as, you know, the editor of a news website. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, I mean, someone said when The Economist wrote this piece about Modi, uh, you know, a bunch of BJP guys said, uh, the West is scared of Modi, and they want to keep India down, and which may not be false, but but I said, you know, look, uh, the West really doesn't care, actually. Um, and I think one of the things I said to this reporter who called me up was, uh, there are seven million voters in Afghanistan, and that election will get as much or more coverage than an election in India, which has a hundred times the number of eligible voters, at least. Um, and I think that's precisely for the reason that Hasid just specified, which is that, um, for British and American audiences, there is this sense of investment in what happens in Afghanistan. Um, I know a lot of, and I don't know if you guys felt this way, a lot of the foreign correspondents who I was friendly with in India, uh, I think were a bit envious of their colleagues in China, which always seemed like the bigger story, right? You could kind of come up with some funny rural Chinese, you know, here's a town where, you know, I, everyone rides a bicycle or something like, you know, whatever, some, some kind of, colorful thing that, you know, in the Indian, the Indian equivalent of that would be considered so obscure that no one would care. And, and there's not this, one of these correspondents, friends of mine in India who used to be in China said uh, that for American newsrooms, um, the China story was the perfect mixture of greed and fear. So to American readers, you thought either, oh, China's a place where we're gonna make a lot of money because they have a billion consumers, or China's a place that may own us someday, so we're afraid of them, we might go to war with them kind of thing. And I think in, in covering India as a foreign correspondent, I think what almost everyone finds to be the greatest challenge is kind of how do you carve a narrative out of this place that is going to make an audience back home interested? And in Afghanistan, that narrative already exists. It's the narrative of the Taliban falling, and, and part of the narrative in terms of this election was, is it gonna happen or not? You know, and it seems like it's been fairly successful. I think in India, even to get to the point where you're able to start carving that narrative, you've got to really bring people along quite a ways. And, and I would say, like, the Indian election, I think the story to me is really a, a process story rather than an outcome story. Um, you know, the, the, an, Amer an election in America or an election in Britain, elections in India are routine, of course, but... Um, not a whole lot changes depending on who, you know, it's you sort of all there is to report is really who wins. Um, I think in India, the story in some ways is is actually just democracy and the kind of, not to be academic about it, but the sort of like very radical proposition of democracy as it exists in India, that, you know, you have a place that starting from its moment of independence, uh, when it was even poorer and even less literate than it is now, uh, had universal franchise and kind of, you know, there's a, there's a Sunil Kalani, the Indian historian, has a great line in his book, The Idea of India, that I won't remember precisely where he says, you know, India doesn't so much have democracy as Indians are constituted as a nation by virtue of their participation in this democratic process. So in some ways, the story of the Indian election, it's going to be a big deal who wins or not, but it's actually just the fact that for not just these seven weeks, but for like the last year, this is all anyone can talk about all the time. I don't know how you tell that to an audience in America or in Britain that like is not necessarily going to invest the time to start learning, you know, who are the characters in this drama kind of thing. But it's it's the sweep of the thing that's really the story. It's not like, well, who wins at the end. So um, if I could just sort of follow up very quickly, uh, a couple of points. One is uh, the, the sweep of the story as you described it. Um, the seems to me one difficulty there is this isn't the first uh, in democratic election in India, so that I guess would have been the story in the last election and the one before that and the one before that. And so um, 
you know, novelty is generally something that you need in stories to... Uh, well, that's, that's why part of the Afghan election, right? This is yeah. Afghanistan's first election uh, without well, Karzai. You know? Well, the next yeah. thing I was going to get to, the, uh, the novelty factor in Afghanistan is partly that it's their first attempt at a peaceful transition of power, that you have the question of this, the uh, per, uh, maintenance of, America, of foreign forces on, on the ballot. So there are all sorts of outcome questions that are hugely consequential. Um, in the India case, but also uh, process questions, is the election going to be disrupted by the Taliban, all those sorts of things. And in the India case, uh, you were actually making the argument that it was really all about the process and not the outcome, because I was going to come back and say, well, in a relatively institutionalized democracy, who cares about the process? I, mean, I care who becomes the next chancellor in Germany or the next president in France. I could care less about the process of the election. I don't read stories about how the election goes because I have general confidence that they're going to conduct a democratic election. But I think, I mean, in in Jonathan's perspective, right, you're writing a long form. If you're coming at it from that way, like that's a to to just try to bring a reader to comprehend 700 million, 850 million, whatever potential voters and how that happens is an, is a beautiful story, even if it's 60 years after the first time that's happened. But I think getting to what you were saying about crafting a narrative for India that is going to make people outside of India care, I think that has been the, one of the great difficulties that foreign correspondents have had, not just to make people care, but to just craft a reasonably accurate narrative. This is a country of 1.2 billion people. What's happening in Assam and what's happening in Gujarat and what's happening in Tamil Nadu and in Bihar, none of those places have anything to do with each other, right? Like, life for any of those people does not have almost any bearing on life for any of those other people. And so what we've done, I think, quite poorly, is that we've, fall, we've fallen into, you're right, so China has its own narrative. We don't have to craft a narrative, yeah. right? Because it's, oh my God, China's coming, right? <laughs> and so India, like, I remember reading, you know, five years ago, one of my colleagues wrote, maybe four years ago, wrote, you know, it was all about India's rising. And it was, okay, so there's China, so we can take India in this BRICS context and say India's rising and India's growing at, you know, somewhere between 6 and 8% a year, and this is amazing. 1.2 billion people, they're going to be buying all our goods, great. We don't have to fear them like China, so we at least have that mercantile narrative. And everything was amazing. And then things went, I mean, this was the same writer. So one huge narrative, India's steaming full steam ahead. And a year later, the same writer wrote a story saying, India is falling apart. It's completely ill. The economy's garbage. Look at corruption. Look at, they were both true, I guess, but they were no more true at the time that he wrote either well, of those stories than at the other time. And I think, I think, it's, I mean, all of us, uh, you know, you came in in 2008, I think maybe you said, you got there in 2010? Nine. Nine. I arrived in 2010. I mean, I think in some ways the, the sort of false golden age of India foreign correspondence was from 2001 until 2008, nine, which was the India shining period. And this was kind of a bogus narrative, although in some ways it was a healthy corrective to a lot of, you know, every story about India, you had to have a guy on a bullet cart, you know, kind of, um, and now instead, or maybe now you had the guy on the bullet cart, but he's got a cell phone and he's doing like a Bollywood dance or something like that. Um, and, and I think in that period of time, and, and this is sort of what formed my idea of how these narratives come together, where I think um, if, if we had colleagues here who were covering India during that time, I think they would tell you uh, that there was more interest because there was a sense of, oh, hey, there's something, there's just, I mean, you know, right, all, all journalists ultimately are uh, captive to the new and the novel, uh, and I think we all try through our, you know, sort of sense of professionalism not to let it get out of hand uh, or, or to, you know, fall for every new shiny story that's out there. But I think you you would have seen a great deal of coverage of India, and a lot of what we've seen in the last two or three years was you know, sort of a rottenness in a way that had, in terms of corruption, in terms of, you know, violence, that uh, economic dysfunction that had kind of been papered over because you had this robust right. growth. And so much of the corruption that blew up, I mean, there's a funny thing for people who are paying, you know, who know the story a little closer, uh, you know, this is the second term of this UPA government, and this has been the term of corruption scandals. 
And the idea is that, well, the first government from 2004 to 2009 was great. And then, like, from 2009 until now, it's been all corruption. Well, all the corruption scandals are all things term, that right? happened in the first term <laughs> when everyone was like, oh, this is awesome. Look at this growth. And then it's like, wait, hang on. We grew really fast because we were giving away mines and forests and, like, anything that anybody wanted. We would just hand it to them, and it was totally corrupt. But at the time, it looked great. It was, like, 10% growth. This is fantastic. So I think, you know, these, the, the narrative has gotten much more complicated, and I think as a result, it's far harder... To, to, to get the buy-in from your audience to say, okay, like, walk with me here and trust me. I'm going to get you to a narrative, but like, it's going to take a little while. The other problem is that whenever there's bad news in India, the bad news from Pakistan or Afghanistan is always much worse, <laughs> right? That's true. So if this story is India shining, that can sell. Okay, that's fine. When it's India not shining so much and fairly dull and broken in the, in the corner, fine, but... Pakistan's going to be much worse. So in the last maybe six or seven years, two stories from India have led bulletins worldwide and been the front page of every paper. The Mumbai attacks and the arguably the, 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 the rape. Delhi rape yeah, like a couple of years ago. Um, in that period, I would say 10 to 15 from Pakistan. You know, that, so that's the kind of, so it, it's kind of like you're, you're in the market and that's what you're competing against. So your colleagues in Islamabad have just got more to do. And are busier and have got the more sellable stories as well. But it's also, like you were saying, it's, it's, it's what people want, right? So before the corruption protests erupted, we had a plan. We had a plan for a series on corruption like nine months before the corruption protests erupted. And there was no market for it. We were told, like, who cares? There's corruption everywhere. Who cares? This was told to me not by people in India, this is told to me by, you know, the people who would give the green light for this series. And um, then the corruption protests, you know, erupted in Delhi and to a lesser extent in Mumbai. And they said, okay, we need more, more those stories. Let's get some of those stories. We're like, these are not like daily things. These were month-long projects. And you had the chance to say yes when we told you this was a big deal. And now, it er well, if you had told us that it was going to erupt into these protests, we would have done it. So now we were kind of ahead of the narrative. We saw kind of where it was going. They didn't want us to be ahead of the narrative so much because there's not really a market for that. The narrative got in front of us, and then it was like, all right, catch up to that narrative. So, you know, to write a story about violence against women in India, no one's going to care two and a half years ago after the Delhi gang rape becomes this huge story. Now everyone wants that story. But, you know, it's, it, it didn't become more dangerous for women two years ago. It, it's arguably probably slightly less dangerous, maybe, because there's more attention to it. I don't know. But, but certainly, you know, there, there was zero market for those stories prior to an event happening and making it okay to tell those stories. Can you open up to the audience? Question. If you could introduce yourself. Oh, um, I'm Alexandra. I'm a, a second year graduate student at the Kennedy School. Um, oh, oh, the King. Oh, okay. Um, actually, I'm, I'm just not going to use it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I spent the last summer in, in Lahore and the past January in Karachi. Um, and I guess I'm wondering about the balance. Like, you guys have mentioned that a lot of the stories coming out of Pakistan are going to get more international coverage. People are more interested in, in what's going on there than some of these other stories in India. But, from a lot of Pakistanis that I would speak to over the summer, they were so frustrated that it was like, oh, it's always the same story coming out about, you know, what's going on here. No one's covering any of the actual, you know, interesting stuff that, that's going on. And so I wonder, like, as you know, people who've obviously spent a lot of time on the ground, how do you balance that, you know, like, you understand that there's going to be a demand for a certain kind of story, but also with the desire to maybe put some stories out there that you think should be, even if initially there's not going to be the international, you know, sort of clamoring for it. My, my biggest thing with, with, with covering South Asia is the desperate avoidance of cliche. You know, I, I hate doing stories that, A, everybody else is doing, which fall into some easy thematic narrative. I really hate doing that. I'd much rather find something interesting that's happening or has happened and uh, maybe extrapolate something broader from it rather than start with some broad theme like oh today let's do let's do malnutrition today we, we haven't done that for a while let's do that and we'll, we'll find some stuff and we'll find a, an NGO that supports what we're trying to say that sort of journalism I don't like on the other hand 
that's fine, but the demand from, say, London or DC or wherever is, is to do things that the audience is comfortable with and they can understand and is, um, resonates with them much more quickly. So there is a tension there. And of course, um, it's often the case, I mean, certainly my experience in India, it's often the case that Indians don't always recognize the country that's portrayed in the foreign media. You know, it's not their India, but then at the same time, whose India is it really? Because everyone's got a different perspective. And Ravi mentioned that, you know, it's a country of 20 odd languages, right? Where different states have got nothing to do with each other. And I suppose as foreigners, when we go in, you know, we're, 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 we're new to things as well. So, yeah, I'd like to not, I'd like to reflect India as well as possible, or Pakistan as well as possible. But there is a tension between trying to do that and then trying to do stories that people actually want to read and listen to and watch. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a really funny like Tumblr that someone came up with that was like veiled women walking in front of buildings or something because it's just like all the stories that come out of like the Middle East and Pakistan. It's like women's like today we'll write about like women's rights and so it's always like the same photo of like a woman in a burqa walking away from something there, or you know. And it's, well, there was a great there was a we we assembled a series of photographs from one news agency that was not mine, but I will not mention who it was of in when when I was based in Jerusalem and it was. Every time a major news event happened that was televised, there was always a picture in the same cafe in Nablus of the same guy in a red keffiyeh looking at the TV. And the only thing that changed was what was on the TV. Right? And we found like a collection of 12 of these. And it was the same guy always sitting there with a hookah looking at like Arafat's funeral or looking at Saddam's body or whatever, it was always that thing. And there's so many themes in that one photo. Yeah, the exactly. and the TV and the, yeah. But I think, you know, I, I'm definitely aware of not trying to, and I'm, I'm sure all three of us are aware of not trying to portray like, what is the stereotype of Pakistan or Afghanistan or of India, but going out and finding stories that, I mean, I at least hope reveal a greater truth that are, but again, are, are small. And I felt by the end what, because as I said, it's very overwhelming to cover this country and try to portray a truth that almost no one is gonna recognize any individual story I write as accurate because it's not going to be accurate for 1.1 of the 1.2 million people, right? It's going to reflect a very small slice of that. But what I've tried to do is, like I was saying with Professor Gupta, is find these people who can tell small stories about this country that are much bigger than themselves. Mm. And, and I found actually, despite the fact that there's obviously a lot of corruption and there's terrible problems, sanitation and violence against women, all of which we've touched on, I actually walked away from India with, by the end, a great sense of hope. Because I found all of these people, individuals, doing amazing things in the face of these shocking, inconceivably enormous challenges. Like you find these uh, people that are just so unbelievably driven and they're, I call them their forces of nature. And whether they're Anil Gupta, who is definitely a force of nature, or um, Ratish Nanda, who is, is running the Aga Khan Foundation's renovation of Humayun's tomb, and has come up with this idea of linking Humayun's tomb to five other parks in Delhi, and then if he can do this and break down all the walls, he'll actually create a park that is significantly larger than Central Park in the middle of Delhi. And if you look at what these parks are now, they're really not looking very nice. But this is, and he just, he's like, it's, is it ever gonna happen? I don't know, but I'm not gonna stop fighting for this. And maybe in 20 years, you know, we'll come back and we'll see this amazing massive, or maybe not, but I'm, this is what I'm gonna do for the next 20 years of my life. And, it's kind of hard for me to walk away from all of these stories and think, you know, there isn't, there isn't some hope even in the face of the bureaucracy and the intractable problems. Well, I think just to add to what, what Ravi has just said, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned Pakistan. I think foreign coverage of Pakistan is probably worse than foreign coverage of India, um, in part because of the kind of perverse incentive that Asit put forward, which is that there's always the terrorism story, there's always the like frightening bearded mullah story to tell. Um, reporters in India at least uh, are driven by competition with one another to find new ways to tell in India stories, many of which will be about violence against women or will be about corruption. Um, 
But I, I think, you know, I have seen foreign coverage of India, I think, get better as people have gotten to be more comfortable with <laughs> spending time on sort of what I used to call kind of particular narratives. Um, I mean, I was in the business of trying to figure out how to make these into like 10,000 word stories. Um, but, you know, you saw, I, I think, you know, to me, the landmark here, um, and I think it was influential in terms of forcing people to think about how they were doing things, was Catherine Boo's book about um, Anawadi, a slum in, in Bombay. Um, I've written about this um, before. Like, she, I think, in some ways threw down a gauntlet and said, look, um, we can't tell the India story well because that's just not possible, right? It's not like you, you can tell, you, you can do solid India stories that over the course of a year or two might add up to a kind of composite picture of the place. But if we're really gonna sort of do things in a, in a pure way, we need to find a story that's small enough that we can, we can really just like present it as itself without having, without having to force it to stand in for something else, right? So you, know, you can go and tell the individual story but often the individual story has to stand in for, you know, here's an example of corruption or here's an example of economic growth or things. And I think, going back to this India-Pakistan thing, the more, you know, as a journalist, this kind of countrywide narrative is like a blessing and a curse. It's great insofar as it's like, it's what gets your stories on A1. You know, like after the gang rape, stories about violence against women in India where, you know, that's, you're gonna be on page one if you have that story. Um, but it's a curse in that, you know, you, you your, everything has to be reduced to that. I'd added one, I'd add, I'd add one thing to that as well. Um, a few years ago when I was in India, back in 2008, and I can speak about this because the editor who, who my editor in London does, is no longer with the BBC, so, you know, sod him. I, I, um, <laughs> I, my, my job quite, for, for quite a while, until we sort of had a long, frank discussion about this and sort of changed things, became much more about keeping bad stories off air than doing interesting stories. We get sort of demands from London to do some story about, I don't know, malnutrition or something. That was an obsession back then for some reason because uh, the UN would bring out the same stats every year and you'd have to cover it and do that story, go to a village. Same thing, you know, pretty much the same piece. You could actually play the same piece from last year and it wouldn't actually make any material difference. So my job became kind of keeping bad stories off air as much as that. And there is that sort of disconnect between what the central command wants and what you see every day as well. And trying to negotiate those things can be tricky as well. Thank you. Pass the mic please. My name is Mong Neo, and I'm a doctoral student in the Graduate School of Education. Uh, I like the way uh, this talk started, so thank you, everyone. And uh, you mentioned about um, Anil Gupta, and, uh, and also the balance, uh, having a countrywide story versus uh, individual stories or stories from different corners. So my question is, um, how often do you go for stories like this? And also, especially places you may have limited um, access due to travel restrictions. Uh, one example comes to my mind, which is the part I'm from, which is the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh. Um, it is fully militarized, and foreigners are not allowed. Uh, you need a special permission to get to that place. But this, these are the places suffer much uh, military-induced violence, um, also uh, government-sponsored mass migration stories. So getting into those places and getting the story from the people and as you said, in some cases, against incredible odds, the community is trying to survive or organize or help each other out, or even coming together and to build schools. Um, how often do you go that th th those kind of stories? Um, and also, um, I wonder if any of you had experience going to Jerome Hill Tracks. Thank you. Uh, I've not been there. Um, it's difficult because a lot of South Asia is restricted. I mean, you can't. You can go to Kabul, but travel outside Kabul is, you know, certainly the BBC, we have to have, uh, fill out a bunch of forms and have security with us and travel in armored vehicles and all that sort of stuff. I can't even go to Pakistan <coughs> because I'm of Indian origin and they don't let 
foreign journalists of Indian origin even in the country anymore. Um, bits of India, I mean, Arunachal you can't go to easily, right? Is that still That's the case? That's the only place, yeah. That's the only place, right? Um, so, yeah, you want to go, but there's not really much chance of you doing it. And if you do it, you have to have a damn good reason for it. And then you also have to have the appetite for the story back home. So there's a lot of reasons not to go. Um, I would say for me that, you know, I had a lot of management. I had a big staff under me. So to get out was always an issue. But I tried to go out and do one of these stories every month. Um, I probably could do 10 of them a year. And I, I got to the, I mean, I didn't get to Chittagong, but I went to like Manipur. The second they lifted the, the, the restrictions on the Northeast, I, I had, you know, we don't know how long those restrictions were going to be lifted. F you know, I, I think within a week I was on a plane to, to Manipur to, to write about just what was going on there because we hadn't been there. Um, but we also have the benefit of having local staff. So I have, you know, I had guys in, in Dhaka who could go to Chittagong. And did occasionally go to Chittagong, and there was a right when I when I got to to India, the Dalai Lama came to Arunachal to Tawang, and I got. They claim I snuck my way into getting a permit. There were they weren't giving permits. They didn't want the foreign media, <coughs> and I had a permit. And I flew to Gauhati, and I got off the plane, and I went to get on the helicopter to go take me to Tawang, and I handed them my permit, and the guy at the counter said. I got a fax about you. Hold on a second. And he went back and he came back and he went like that. And so I didn't go. But at the same time, I immediately called back to Delhi and I said, you have to send an Indian because she can go no problem. It doesn't even make any sense, right? I mean, we're still the AP. The BBC was there. Everybody was still there. We just sent local staff. I don't totally understand what the government got out of banning you know, people with different passports from going, but everybody was still there with the Dalai Lama showing that. They didn't want us to go there because of China, but still. Um, so I think, you know, was there an appetite for like the Manipur story? Probably not, but we still did it um, because we're there and it's an important, it's a really important story. So yeah, you just try to do what writers do, right? Which is create an appetite where one doesn't exist. So. I think it's also part of the, I mean, I'm, I have no stories to tell like this because I was an editor, so I <laughs> sat in an office. Uh, I mean, I traveled around occasionally, but never to, to, to work on writing stuff. Um, I think, though, it's part of the sort of the, the I want to say almost kind of the political economy of these internal conflicts is that um, as a government, one way in which you can exert some control, in addition to whatever military control you have over a place, is to keep people out um, and to keep foreign reporters out. Um, and I think the more you do that, I mean, it's, I think as journalists, we're very cynical about this. And it's very easy to look at these stories and to say, like, oh, these fools, like, <laughs> India thinks they don't let us go to Kashmir. No one's going to know about Kashmir. Um, but I do think it's true that over time, um, you can kind of push a story from the front pages and uh, just by you know discouraging reporters from going there, discouraging the local media from covering it, um, you know in, in in you know the the Indian internal conflict that I know the best is the is the Kashmir conflict, and uh, you know kind of it's very much on the back burner now. You know you don't you don't hear about it a whole lot. You uh, I think most Indians just as I don't know if there was like a separatist conflict in South Dakota, we probably wouldn't spend a lot of time here thinking about it. We'd go about our daily lives. But, but uh, you know, there's a way of kind of trying to sort of downplay these things and just to kind of keep them out of view. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people all over the world were, you know, all up in arms about what was happening in Tibet. And today, everybody knows that it's not great, but we don't talk about it very much. So I, it's a, it's, I think it's a funny challenge. And, and Ravi talking about the Manipur thing is interesting because as a reporter, uh, it's a great story, and it's like, oh, here's here's something no one else is doing. Um, but that paradoxically is going to mean there's not much appetite for it because everyone else isn't also doing it. I would say just on, on Kashmir, um, just because I want to tell a funny story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is it better than my story? Everything's better than your story. <laughs> so it, in Kashmir, I went, I mean, there's kind of two related Kashmiri stories, but I went there in the middle of... Uh, quite a bit of violence that was going on there. 
And of course, you have to register as a foreigner. You have to register at the airport in Srinagar. And at one point, um, there was an enormous um, what's it called shutdown in, in the middle of town. There was a curfew and a bond. nothing. It wasn't a bond. It was a curfew. Okay. There was probably also a bond, but it's hard to tell because yeah, yeah, they're yeah. both happening at the same time. And I was interviewing Omar Abdullah, and I said, "Well, when are you going to lift this curfew?" And he said, there's no curfew. I said, you know, I'm sitting right in front of you, right? Like, <laughs> I'm here. I'm in the town. <laughs> I drove to your office. There's no one on the street. The army's keeping everyone. And he just, he was like, no, but, but they just ch are choosing to kind of stay home. And this is, so there was that incredibly weirdness. But, um, but there was no kind of pressure on me in a military way. But then I came... Maybe a year later, things had calmed down. It was opening up again, tourism. I brought my family. We were just on vacation. And we went into a national park, and uh, I was with um, our local Kashmiri reporter. And he said, oh, yeah, you're, uh, you've, got, you've got a guest. And I was like, what are you talking I was on vacation. I wasn't paying any attention. I said, what are you talking about? And apparently, I had picked up a tail at the airport. And uh, you would think I'd have more awareness because he was like a six foot four Sikh man with an enormous pink turban in the middle of Kashmir, right? And I just looked around and I was like, that guy's been, he's like, yeah, that guy's been with you for a day and a half. Like, and I never noticed, but so in this weird time of peace, I was being tailed. Whereas in this time of violence, they were too busy to actually follow me around. So this guy went on vacation with me, which was neat. <laughs> the biggest story in South Asia, arguably, and it's always arguable, is Waziristan. Uh, no chance of any of us going there. No. Absolutely no chance at all. No one really knows what's going on. I mean, there's obviously a big anti-drone campaign. You know kind of what's going on. No chance of any of us getting there, though, to see it. So. Well, also the Naxal story, which right. no one knows what's really happening. And yeah. We can't get anywhere near there, you know, for the most part. Unless you're armed not to Well, and it's, I mean, I think it's a, it's a depressing <laughs> thing to contemplate as a journalist that, um, Again, not not to be too pessimistic about it, but governments can be very effective with this, and you know they don't they putting up barriers to getting in um, is not ever going to stop us from covering something, um, but you know over time it will result in less coverage. Other questions. sort of a funny question. It has to do with about time, scale, scope, and media. Um, you have certain restrictions because you're immediate and, and, and you get resistant at home and, and over there. What, how different do you think it is between, between news and print media, people who are writing a book, could be on the same issues, a longer time frame, making movies, making documentaries, do you think the issues are the same uh, in terms of interests here, uh, except there's some topical interests in, in small areas, uh, and resistance over there? So when you say resistance, what, what, what do you mean? Well, somebody who doesn't want you to, or, or, or says, gee, this is your work, and says, well, you know, you don't want to take this guy seriously, or you know, you don't. But uh, sometimes when people have a longer time for, you know, they're writing a book, or they're making a movie, or they're doing, so even if they have to smuggle in the equipment, they have a different way, but still there's what I, you would call foreign perception of India and local perception of India. And, and where do you feel fit into the larger media? And I, I consider authors and filmmakers and uh, other people part of media. Well, I, would, I mean, so I'm not sure, I don't, I don't, I may share Hassett's not total understanding, but I mean, I think I would point to a couple of what I would see as sort of trade-offs. And I would say the first trade-off that you're looking at is that someone who's working on a book um, is, is going to be able to really invest time and resources and sophistication in telling a much more particular story. Um, I don't think it'd be right to say it's a more accurate story. That's too... That's too dramatic, but you know, you're, you're going to be able to get sort of very deep into the nuances of something. The trade-off is that your sort of less nuanced, shorter story is going to be in your newspaper or on your wire service or on your BBC World Service, and it's going to get before a whole lot more people. Um, so if you write a book about, you know, what's happening in Bihar right now, um, you could write a great book 
and you could really nail, you know, this is life in Bihar in 2013. Uh, Amitabh Kumar, in fact, has written a book sort of like that uh, about Patna. Uh, but that's not something a lot of people are going to see. So I think that's a little bit of the trade-off. Um, but that's what sometimes drives the people who are writing the everyday stories to eventually say, well, I have to write a book about it. Yeah, I, no, I, think that's, I think that's true to a degree. And I think the, um, but I think another thing, I mean, something, I can't remember who mentioned it, the, the foreign media depends in part, like at any English-speaking Indian would, on the local English language media. I mean, they sort of set the news agenda. And I think that it's a funny game because everyone is, there's a high, fair amount of suspicion. And, and I think there's a sense that, you know, for all of its charms, the Indian media has some problems. Um, but that was understating. You know. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's a funny. I, I, I had, I, I went kind of full circle on this. I mean, I started very skeptical. The more local journalists that I met who really knew what they were doing, the more impressed I was, and then I kind of became very uh, cynical about the ownership, which I think really is where your problem lies. Um, in terms of resistance, what I think you will often find, much more so in my experience than in the West, it depends on who you're dealing with. I, I was working at a magazine where you know, our sort of stock and trade was kind of profiles and, and writing in a, in, a, in a, for India, kind of an unprecedentedly deep way about major public figures, whether in the business world, in the media, in politics especially. And I think what you find in the West is that because the media is, relatively speaking, more powerful here um, and more respected and more feared, uh, People are much more cooperative. Um, so I think in, in my three years at Caravan, I must have done you know 30 some profiles um, that I worked on as an editor, and almost no one ever gave permission to participate. Um, and people would go way out of their way to stop us. You know, they would threaten us. They would call all their colleagues and friends and say, "Don't talk to this person." They would, you know. There are examples of, of people trying to say, you know, what, I'll give you anything. You know, tell me what you want me to do so that you don't write about me. Um, and uh, you don't really have that here. You know, there's a bit more of a sense here as a public figure that if you play ball with the media, you stand to gain something. You know, um, it might just be vanity. You, you wanna, I want my face to be on the cover of your magazine. Um, but I think this, that, that's the resistance that, that I've seen. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, the great example would be, I think it was two and a half or three years ago when Manmohan Singh decided he needed a new media strategy because I don't think he had a media strategy and that he was going to have a weekly press conference or at least initially it was going to be him maybe that it would be someone from the office from his office but you know this idea of the White House has a daily briefing with the press because it's America it's a big country there's always an issue something someone who wants to respond to something and why shouldn't India have the same thing it's a huge country in a very important region that they can't at least a weekly briefing so Manmohan Singh said, I'm going to have a weekly press conference. And he gave a press conference. And um, I can't remember, the, he made some comment on Bangladesh, actually, that was supposed to be off the camera or in the, it, it was um, supposed to be redacted from the official transcript, but it got into it so that everybody printed it. And that was the first and last of his weekly press conferences. He didn't have another press conference. I don't think even. Until now, I don't think he's had a press conference in, in like two and a half years. So the media is just sort of, it, it's kind of cut out of people's calculation as a politician. Well, and it's, I, I, it's just to amplify this, I can't remember which one, uh, Manmohan has had three or four media advisors. Right. Um, and I think it was Harish Kare, who was the second of these, but I can't remember specifically, who told a reporter working with me, look, we don't care about the media. The media, you guys, the English language media, only influence a tiny, tiny slip. What he said, for anyone who's been in Delhi, the con market crowd. And everybody else, we have different ways of reaching them. We'll put up billboards, we'll send candidates. And, and I think that this goes back to where I started with this question of how these institutions interact with one another. You know, America is a mostly homogenous, mostly, you know, Middle classy kind. Of, well, I, we don't want to get into generalizations, but like you know, if you're Obama going on TV and being on all the three or four major networks and making a major speech is a fairly effective way, less effective than it was ten or fifteen years ago, but a fairly effective way to reach all Americans. 
Um, even if Manmohan Singh was willing to do this, which he's not, uh, it's not clear that actually most Indians would see it. Or in their own language or understand yeah, exactly, it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, there's what, 350 news channels or something, and they're all in different regional languages. I mean, the, the biggest indicator is that um, newspapers in regional languages are, the sales are going through the roof, and TV channels are doing really well. English is kind of stagnant and is a small market, it really is. And I remember once we were, we were trying to interview the finance minister, I can't remember who it was exactly. There was a big thing, and we were trying to do an interview, and we were saying, we're the BBC, you know, we, we, we demand access, this is the way we... I said, no, I say we, it wasn't me personally, but the BBC as a whole. And so, we, you know, and the, the, you know, the, the press guy was very candid with us. He said, look, you're, you're not important to us. You can do an interview in a couple of days if you want. But right now, we've got to hit the Hindi channels, then possibly the English language channels in India. International media is just not relevant to us because we don't, no Indians watch you, no Indians listen to you. So. so what we ended up doing in the end, because we couldn't get... Um, ministers, we couldn't get ministers, we couldn't get Chinamaram or any of these guys to answer our phone calls, or even their press people. I've never been in a country where they give you a list of all the spokesmen and they're all landlines. There's no cell phone on yeah. there. And you just can't get somebody after 5 o'clock and, and before 11 o'clock, and then there's lunch and tea somewhere in between. And um, so you have like two hours a day, you might be able to get somebody. So what we did was every day we compiled the list of the public events of every minister in the government. And that would be like on my desk in the morning. And then if anyone had a story that was relevant, that one of those ministers was relevant, we would show up at whatever they were doing and we would ask them a question about whatever this totally separate story was. And often they were really angry at us, but this was the only chance we had. So I went to like a book lunch Chidambaram was presiding over when he was uh, home, home minister. and. He, as he was walking out, I went to ask him something about the Naxals or whatever, and he just looked at me. He was like, no, and he walked out. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, you would get an answer, but that was the only way to even try because there is no system for dealing with the media. But I think also there's not a lot of system for dealing with the regional media. It's not like when they said when Manmohan Singh doesn't do a press conference, it's not that he's not doing just an English language one, right? He's not, he doing, doing, anything, yeah. he's not doing Hindi. He's not doing Gujarati. He's not... He's not doing. He's not doing a press conference. He, the media has been removed from their yeah. equation in its totality, and I contrast it with with Israel, where I worked, where we would call like the army spokesman, and they would say, "Where are you calling from?" And say, "I'm calling from AP." Okay, we'll tra we'll send you to the North American desk, and you would have somebody whose job was to deal with the North American media. And if I were calling from a Brazilian newspaper, they would send me to the Portuguese desk where somebody would speak to me in Portuguese. Or someone, if I were calling from Argentina, they'd speak to me in Spanish. Like they're, they have this massive infrastructure for dealing with the media. And they have a you know, weekly briefing, and in the middle, of, you could call somebody in the middle of a cabinet meeting. Literally, we've called ministers, and they've answered their phones on the floor of parliament. And they've, I'm, I'm in the middle of a debate. Okay, is it, make it quick. You know, they wouldn't even like, they'd still answer, they'd still give a, that in India, you know, I think, it's... I think this, and so it's interesting you mentioned Israel as a point of comparison, though, is that in some ways I think, you know, Manmohan's dismissal of the Indian English language media in some ways is behind the times, but in other ways it's a rational reflection of the real incentives for an Indian politician. And I think if you look at India dealing with the foreign media, and clearly India has allowed itself to kind of get behind the eight ball, um, but the foreign media is less important to running India than the foreign media is to running Israel. But um, not just the foreign media, the local media. Yeah, like he I, dismisses no, I mean, the local media. He's not holding press conferences for the local media. He's not reaching out to the local media. Yeah, that's no, that's, that's, and that's true. That's important to the functioning of Indian no, because democracy. The, because <laughs> because the, the, but, but they they get their message out, right? Because there are plenty of publications or individual journalists who have the inside track. And who get that? Well, they, they have. And I, I would right? say they're also. I mean, I don't know too much about this, but um, in part because at Caravan we tended not to have reporters on specific beats. But there is, in a way that, it sort of resembles what we have here, but is maybe a little cozier than an American journalist would be comfortable with. A sort of briefing culture where the you know we did a big profile at one point of Kapil Sibyl, 
who was the sort of uh, loudmouth, uh, smarter than thou, was then Minister of Education, um, among other things. Uh, and the education beat reporters knew everything. Um, and, and in a way where, for us at Caravan, it was a bit of a paradox because the education beat reporters were all sort of, the, the, whoever covered a certain ministry, there was like almost a kind of like capture where the reporter almost has a kind of perverse loyalty to the minister and is not likely to sort of you know, burn them on an embarrassing story or, or burn a sore, you know, like. Uh, and we were coming in from the outside, which allowed us sometimes to do things that were much harder hitting, but you had this problem where I would have to give up, you know, I'd have to let a reporter spend like two months just trying to figure out what the hell was going on um, because the people who knew what was going on weren't really, you know, they'd keep stuff out of the papers or they'd kind of spin it a certain way. And also, I mean, at that point, you, you look at when you pick up an Indian newspaper, and you pick up 10 Indian newspapers, and they all will have a, the same education story from, it wouldn't even be like a high-ranking government official said. Like, the anonymity is so weirdly worded. It's always like, we have learned. We've learned. That's it. Or it has been said. Or like, it's just floating. It's just knowledge that's kind of somehow received. We don't know from where, not even from a source, right? It's, no, it it's, has it's, been learned. It's, no, it's, an, it's an official. No, official. no, sometimes it's an official and sometimes it has been learned. But no, but the official carries, uh, officials, anyone from the guy manning reception, right, to the <laughs> to minister, minister. The minister. It could be or anything. His, it's all, yeah. 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 And it's, but what that does is also, because I think there's not a briefing culture, it there's not a culture of authority being questioned. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, this, the, I, I'm obsessed with this idea of how the institutions interact with one another. And in some ways, the, we take for granted in the West the idea of a kind of autonomous, independent, adversarial media. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, it's simply the case that the Indian media as an institution does not function that way at the moment, I think. You know, and I don't, I mean, I think it's easy to think of this as like a deficiency of Indian journalists or newspapers, and I don't think it's quite that. I think it's yeah. that this is, there's a whole sort of history that leads up to this. Um, and, and the media can be very adversarial when it wants to, um, but, but it, it feels often, and I think anyone who's spent time in Delhi has had this experience that like, kind of almost everyone works for the same company. You know, the people who work for the government, the people who work for the media, the people who work for a big business house are all kind of more on the same team than would be the case in New York, for example. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nora from the South Asia Institute. Um, so there's been some commentary on Catherine Boo's book and the problematic elements of having an outsider writing about the slums. And I was wondering, um, in your perspective, you know, how you grapple with being a foreigner. You spoke about a little earlier, Hassett, that you sort of just realized that, that you were foreign uh, when you went to Kashmir. And I was wondering, you know, how, do, how does that uh, impact your writing and how do you, how do you think about that? Um, I don't always feel a foreigner, you know, it just depends on the context. In that context, I really did. Um, but I don't, I don't worry about it too much. You know, I, I mean, I, I haven't just worked in South Asia, I've worked in London and in other countries. I was in, based in Brussels for a while as well. And I think the basic principles stay the same. You still have your, your basic journalistic principles and you try and do your work um, the same way. Um, I suppose one, one, one good thing about being a journalist is that you don't have to know anything. Like, you, you're there to ask the questions and find out stuff and then, you know, hopefully present it in a comprehensible way to your audience. So it's actually okay to be a little bit ignorant and to be foreign and to be, you know, an outsider. So I, I've never worried about it too much, apart from that one incident when I got exposed as being not a Kashmiri. A very short Kashmir. Very short, but still very handsome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, the criticism of Catherine Booth, it's not even a criticism of the book, right? It's a criticism of her identity writing that book. And I think it's, it's really missing the point, right? It's not that she wrote that book 
instead of an Indian writing that book. I mean, that book would not exist if she didn't write that book. And isn't the world richer for having that book be in the world? If an Indian were to also to have written that book, the world would be probably equally as rich for having that book out Indians, there. Indians criticize India. I mean, I mean, right? Well, Indians do all the. Well, I mean, there's plenty of very and and you know, get, and, and also get slated for it as well. I mean, you know, there totally. is a, there is a definitely a culture of, you know, there's a weird nationalism that emerges. Um, when an Indian does something which is considered anti-Indian, um, right. that happens, and there's not that different to when a foreigner writes about India. Actually. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, yeah the circle the wagons kind of mentality, yeah. but it's it's whoever wrote the book, it's not relevant. It's relevant. Does the book stand up? And if you look at if you look at behind the beautiful forevers, and you say, this is just isn't isn't working for me. This isn't accurate. It's not it, to me. I read that book and I thought this is the truth. This is what I've experienced in my. I mean, admittedly, all of our far less, you know, far more limited periods of times in slums than she spent like three to five years in this slum. We spent maybe a few weeks total in these slums. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But what I've seen is very similar, you know, it, it rings very true to me. And I think that's, that's what matters, and I don't think it matters so much who you are doing that. Now, in some ways, it's easier to be a foreigner. I grew up in New Jersey. I left New Jersey. I came back to New Jersey as a reporter when I was 22. And as a reporter in New Jersey, it was the first time I knew any of the stuff that was going on in New Jersey. I was like, oh my god, this place is unbelievably corrupt. I had no idea this was happening. I didn't see my own town, my own, my own area. I was covering riots that were five minutes from the house I grew up in. I didn't know any of this stuff living there. So sometimes you kind of it's better to have an outsider's perspective, to come in and, you know, we don't come in with the baggage of, of having lived our lives and seen it become a mirror to it. So, you know, we kind of see it and go, oh my God, do you see that guy in the bullet cart? Okay, that's bad, but yeah. no, no, that no. guy's got a cell phone now. But other people would say, uh, you now, know. I think, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I often like to think of Kate Boo's book in, in kind of tandem with a book by a very talented Indian journalist um, named Aman Sethi, right. uh, who, full disclosure, is a friend of mine. Um, and he wrote a book uh, that in some ways is like almost a kind of a Delhi counterpart to Kate's book, which is that, you know, his book is called A Free Man. Um, and it's sort of about one guy and sort of his friends, but, you know, basically a, a, a small group of what maybe in America you think of as sort of day laborers um, who are functionally homeless guys, although in India homelessness is a slightly different concept, who sleep on pavements in Old Delhi, and they're, you know, uh, they do day work. You know, they, they a guy will come by and say, I'm painting a house. Who wants to come paint the house today? And what I thought was interesting is Aman grew up in Delhi, in Defense Colony. Um, Aman's book is a little more overt than Kate's book in terms of placing him in the narrative, right? I think that's one way as a reporter, if you're working in a narrative frame, you can sort of foreground your distance and say, oh, look, here I am, an outsider. Um, Aman is barely closer socioeconomically to his characters than Kate is to her characters. Even though he speaks Hindi, even though he grew up in the same city as these guys, you know, he's gone to Columbia University to do a journalism degree. He's grown up in one of the ritziest neighborhoods in Delhi. He barely has more in common with these guys than Kate Boo does with these people who live in Anawadi. What I think made her book, I mean, she's, you know, maybe you know, one of the greatest reporters working now, but I think what made it so good, which had, is not connected to her foreignness, although maybe her foreignness was a factor in this, was the sort of restrained way in which it focused on these particulars. You know, I compare it, the, the, the book by a foreigner who comes in and says, I'm not gonna get too deep because I don't understand this place very well, and I'm just going to kind of do like an overview of like this is India right now in 2014. That's a much bigger failure in my view than going way down into something. And I think for me as someone who was in India and was frustrated often by how India was written about, what was unique about that book was its sort of resistance to abstraction of like trying not to be like, let me tell you about India. Um, and I think, you know, more people are doing this now, not just because of her, I think it's a sort of general sense that, like, we need to tell more of these very specific stories. Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time, so um, everybody can... Uh,
join me in thanking our panelists for really. <laughs> this is really